One of the first things I notice when I watch a jellyfish float through the water is how gracefully it moves and how utterly helpless it would be on land. Its flimsy body without the support of a bony skeleton has limited options for how it can live and move, and if not for the buoyancy and support of water, it would collapse, starve, and die. Unlike the jellyfish, animals on land have some kind of support, like our bony endoskeleton or the rigid exoskeletons of arthropods. For most of our education, we're taught that the main job of the human skeleton is to provide structure and support for our squishy insides. It's a framework that we can attach connective tissue and muscles to. But in the last few decades, scientists have begun appreciating our bones as dynamic organs in their own right, doing everything from managing blood production, regulating acid-base balance, and even producing hormones. If you're new to the channel, welcome. My name is Patrick, and this channel is all about the human body and how we learn about it. This is gonna be a pretty information-heavy video, so here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna do a super quick overview of bone anatomy to show you what kind of materials we're working with, then go over three processes that I think are interesting. Capiche? Your adult skeleton has about 206 bones that make up the skeleton you're used to seeing. Almost all of these bones are wrapped in a kind of connective tissue called the periosteum. Peri for around, osteum for bone. This stuff hooks up to blood vessels, which gives it access to main circulation. And that's super important for the rest of this video. Bone has access to circulation. Bone itself is a connective tissue made mostly of collagen peppered in with some calcium phosphate. It can be arranged as compact or spongy bone, which are exactly what they sound like. Compact is 80% of the bone in your body and makes a good outer shell for bone, while spongy bone takes up more space and responds much more quickly to stress than compact bone. Under a microscope, compact bone forms this beautiful and intricate pattern. Uh, trypophobes, you may wanna look away though. When we look at a cross section of compact bone, we see bundles of tissue in this circular pattern. That's an osteon, which is the functional unit of bone. As you can see, it's pretty tightly packed in there. So we have to be strategic with how we feed bone and move things around. Each of these osteons has a central canal with blood vessels and lymphatic vessels in them to transport nutrients and waste. These canals are surrounded by layers of hardened tissue called lamellae. This is the stiff, structural material of bone. Embedded within the lamellae are little pockets called lacunae, which is where cells live, and tinier channels called canaliculi so that the cells can communicate with each other. But we'll come back to those. Spongy bone is a little different. It doesn't have those nicely arranged osteons. It's a little bit messier. If we took a cross section of one of those, we still find layers of lamellae, but arranged as structures called trabeculae. Since it isn't as cramped as compact bone, nutrients have a much easier time moving around, which is awesome since we can use simple diffusion to float stuff through. Again, this is all to set up the structure we're working with. You have all of these canals and blood vessels and hard lamellae to work with, but you also have cells that are constantly busy remodeling bone, which is the first process I wanna talk about. And it's not just in the case of breaking bones and repairing them, I mean all the time. There are two big reasons for this. First, bone is storage for calcium and other minerals. It has plenty to share if somewhere else in the body needs some. Second, bone responds to the stress placed on it. It's called Wolf's Law. If we increase the stress on bone, our bodies lay down more bone. If we decrease stress, our bodies won't replace bone that quickly. Use it or lose it. That's why we recommend weight-bearing activity and resistance training for people with osteoporosis. That physical stress encourages more bone density. So, which cells are actually doing the thing? Well, if you remember our osteon model, mature bone cells called osteocytes live in the lacunae and sense any changes to stress placed on the bone. Then they can send out chemical messengers to trigger growth. 90% of our bone cells are osteocytes. So the other 10% either build bone, what are called osteoblasts, or clean and clear bone, what are called osteoclasts. We're gonna get more detailed, but that little name trick helped me remember who's who. Bone remodeling starts with the resorption phase, when osteoclasts start pumping out enzymes and hydrogen ions to start dissolving the extracellular matrix of the bone, which is mostly collagen and calcium. Now that we've got little scooped out divots, cells around that area secrete growth factor that signal to osteoblasts to begin building. They deposit a bunch of collagen and minerals and then do one of three things. They either flatten out and line the surface of the bone, become an osteocyte, or undergo apoptosis and die. If it does become an osteocyte, 
is now responsible for conducting this process and turning up or down bone remodeling. That's a complicated job for osteocytes though. They have to turn mechanical stress into biochemical signals. I got you though. Those osteocytes are surrounded by fluid in the lacunae, and when the bone is under stress, that fluid flows past the cell membranes of the osteocytes, which sends a slight shear force past the cell. Special mechanosensors are embedded into their cell membranes that pick up on this movement of fluid, and they all work a little differently. For example, there are some channels that let ions into the cell, and when more ions are flowing past this channel than usual, that's probably a sign that fluid is what's moving ions around. Collectively, these sensors will activate a chemical pathway that goes to the target cells. There are a lot of asterisks and whatabouts in mechanosensation, so I include a link to the comprehensive review I used for fact checking in the description. It's real dense. Other chemicals, namely hormones like estrogen, calcitonin, or parathyroid hormone can influence how bone remodeling goes too, both up and down. Like during menopause or if someone is estrogen deficient, that person's bone cleaning and clearing outpaces their bone building. And actually, knowing that hormones can influence bone remodeling is one of the clues that led researchers to look into bone as an endocrine organ in its own right. If you're new to hormones, they are so much more than estrogen and insulin. Hormones are the main chemical messengers of our endocrine system. They send messages through the bloodstream all across the body. The main bone hormone is osteocalcin, a chemical that can influence blood sugar, exercise capacity, brain development, and fertility in people with testes. For example, bone has a feedback loop with the pancreas, which makes a big deal hormone, insulin. The idea is that osteoblasts on bone can detect insulin, and when they do, they increase osteocalcin production. In turn, the pancreas can detect osteocalcin, and when it does, it increases insulin production. Some very important caveats, though. Most of our data to support this comes from rodent studies. Like research published in 2012 and 2017 found that mice that don't produce insulin very well saw improved glucose tolerance after getting daily osteocalcin injections. Unfortunately, we don't know yet if this translates perfectly to humans. We've seen osteocalcin stimulate beta cells growth, the pancreatic cells that make insulin when we study them in a dish, but we haven't seen that yet in a human body. And this is one of those things that might be really helpful in designing treatments for folks with type 2 diabetes, but we don't have enough data to support it yet. There's also evidence that osteocalcin impacts fertility, but only for animals with testes. A few years ago, scientists noticed that mice who didn't make lots of osteocalcin had smaller litter sizes compared to wild type mice. So in follow-up experiments, researchers put ovary and testes tissue in dishes with osteoblasts or without osteoblasts. The testes with osteoblasts increased testosterone production while the ovary tissue didn't increase estradiol or progesterone production. To make sure the difference in testosterone was due to osteocalcin and not some other chemical, scientists did a similar experiment where they put Leydig cells, the cells that actually make testosterone, in with osteoblasts, except this time they modified the osteoblast to either produce osteocalcin or not. The ones that didn't make osteocalcin did not lead to increased testosterone production, making them think that osteocalcin was responsible for that bump in testosterone. Taking that even further, the researchers supplemented those light egg cells with straight up osteocalcin, which increased testosterone production in a dose dependent manner. More osteocalcin, more testosterone. But again, this was in mice, and mice aren't people. And a lot of this initial research was done by one lab and hasn't been replicated. Osteocalcin is just one of the things that bone can pump into the bloodstream though. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, all kinds of cells start in the bone marrow in a process called hematopoiesis. Specifically in the red marrow between the spongy bone. It has a bunch of hematopoietic stem cells or HSCs Stem cells are cells that can become other types of cells. Hematopoietic means it's going to turn into a blood cell. At any given time, you have HSCs in your bloodstream too, but they started in bone marrow. You also have yellow marrow, but it hangs out in the medullary cavity of the bone shaft and is mostly fat cells. Our bodies are constantly turning these HSCs into blood cells because erythrocytes, or mature red blood cells, don't have nuclei so they don't divide or make copies of themselves through mitosis. By not having a nucleus and other organelles, erythrocytes can maximize how much hemoglobin it has and how much oxygen it can carry. That's a whole separate video though. So if we start out with an HSC, it has all these options in front of it of what it can become or differentiate into. Obviously this chart is pretty extensive, so I just have a few notes. First, 
naming conventions. You see a lot of those root words like site and blast in this chart. And as a refresher, site indicates cells like erythrocyte, monocyte, or lymphocyte, while blast means it'll give rise to something else. Myeloblast can turn into all of these things. And then pro in this case doesn't mean professional, it's more like prototype. It's a stage where it's already differentiated into some level of specialization, but it's not mature yet. Finally, this chart makes it seem like there are super distinct, evenly spaced stages throughout every step of this process, but in reality, it's messy and has different timings and durations from each other, and might be more streamlined than this multi-stage map shows. These three phenomena are just the tip of the iceberg for amazing things that Bones can do. But clearly, it's more than a static skeleton and is involved in so many of our body systems. If you're interested in more bone-related videos, I have a playlist that's all musculoskeletal related and I'm always adding to it, so check that out. Otherwise, if my videos help you out, consider subscribing, checking out Patreon, or just hitting the bell icon so you get notified when I post a new video. Have fun, be good, thanks for watching.